2006 was a transitional year for the Pennsylvania-bred alternative metal act CKY. Their departure from Island Records can be attributed to a few major concerns. Firstly, their five-year contract was up. Island's A&R representative Paul Pontius wanted to re-sign and do another album with the band, but CKY had strong doubts that Island would put forth the effort to adequately support the next record. Despite the trajectory of growth that they had exhibited from their first album to their third album, they still felt disappointed time after time in Island's promotional endeavors. Furthermore, frontman Darren Miller claimed that Island was going to cut the advance on their next outing in half. None of this felt favorable for the band, so they decided to end the relationship and head for greener pastures in April. With CKY freshly signed to Roadrunner Records in December of 2006, it seemed all was finally falling back into place for the quartet. Their first breakup in June was short-lived and seemed to be water under a bridge. But maybe what the band needed was some time to work apart from one another. Darren Miller had co-founded a melodic death metal side project a few months earlier known as World Under Blood with Tim Young of Morbid Angel. The duo recorded demos with former Machine Head guitarist Logan Mater. These demos were mixed by Mater and released to the World Under Blood MySpace page. By the end of the following year, World Under Blood would recruit decrepit birth bassist Risha Ariavec and sleep terror guitarist Luke Yeager. At this time, drummer Jess Margera was also beginning to form his stoner rock supergroup known as The Company Band with members of Clutch, Puny Human, and Fireball Ministry. Not to mention that Jess had already joined the English rock group Viking Skull. It almost seemed like the members of CKY already had too much on their plate to commit to recording another full-length LP together. The fans, known as the CKY Alliance, were clamoring to hear a return to the glory days after the slightly less favorable fan response to an answer can be found. But the momentum that they built thus far also did seem to lessen a bit, especially after their breakup and reformation. Nevertheless, Roadrunner and CKY looked to be a match made in heaven. After all, Darren grew up listening to plenty of death metal bands signed to Roadrunner in his youth, so much so that it created a friendship with the head of A&R, Monty Connor. Connor is responsible for signing legendary metal acts such as Slipknot, Immolation, Death, Cynic, Typo Negative, plus a host of others. Clearly, the man has an undeniable ear for heavy music. Plus, it can't hurt to have a powerful friend at the record label, someone who can fight for you and help give you a big push. Production on their newest record started in January 2007. Normally, a band would receive an advance from the record label and use the money to pay for studio time as well as food and lodging expenses. This advance would then be paid back via record sales. Think of it as sort of a loan. However, in this case, CKY would now opt to use the advance money to create a studio and lead guitarist and producer Chad Ginsberg's home in New Hope, Pennsylvania. This would be the first CKY record to feature bass played by someone other than Darren or Chad. Matt Dice, following his hiring in 2005, took up bass duties, and for the first time in CKY's history, there were bass parts on a record that didn't just complement the guitar riffs. In fact, the bass playing on this release was surprisingly memorable and made the song stronger. The album would feature many songs that were demoed in years past. Plagued by Images was written all the way back in 1996 and was overdubbed from the state it was left in 2001 during the recording of IDR. Woe Is Me, Stripped Your Speech, and Old Carver's Bones date back to 1997, with the first of the three being another track mostly finished during the recording of IDR. Doubled Up on Trauma dates back to around 1998. The instrumental songs, Fisherman's Wharf Parts 1 and 2, were actually demoed well enough at the Groundhog in 99 during the recording of Volume 1, to the point that all they had to do was add some overdubbed synthesizers. It would appear that this new release would also be uninhibited by obtuse creative limitations. An answer can be found was recorded and mixed with the idea in mind that the band would not use keyboards, synthesizers, or anything particularly extraneous to fill out the sound. Darren has since stated that this rule came from Chad and wasn't ever something that sat right with him. To give Chad the benefit of the doubt seems to make sense here. 
I can assume his intention as a producer was to release an album that would make more cohesive sense when played in a live setting. See, up to this point, CKY didn't even have a dedicated keyboardist for their live shows, and thus played their synthesizer-drenched songs without any actual synth or keyboard accompaniment. Perhaps Chad feared that the use of keyboards might come off as a gimmick or a crutch of some sort, and wanted the guitar riffs and songwriting to stand on their own. All respectable reasons for such a decision. Unfortunately, that direction only stripped away a layer of CKY's uniqueness, and something that the fans grew to expect on the albums. This time, the new songs would again embrace that sense of overproduction that made Volume 1 and IDR such standout records. There's always a fine line that can be walked with overproduction, but it seemed like Ginsberg and Miller were way in over their heads and biting off far more than they could ever hope to chew. They would eventually find that overcomplicating the mix can turn off your listeners. Now, during the recording process, the band felt creatively unencumbered. Instead of worrying about studio time and getting the right sound as quickly as possible, recording at Chad's house allowed them to indulge their experimental impulses, adding all sorts of effects and layers to their already dense sound. They loved how the record was coming along, but the process would soon hit a brick wall. By October, while on the 2007 Viva La Bands tour, the members of CKY would find themselves in even more drama, this time resulting in violence. Chad let fans know after a show in St. Louis that Darren had quit the band to pursue World Under Blood. Darren would not let this pass quietly, however, and aired his grievances on the World Under Blood MySpace page. You can read the quote on screen, but I'll try to sum it up. Darren alleges that the strains of Tor were exacerbating his alcohol use, and he began drinking heavily to cope with his insomnia. After the St. Louis show, he had overheard Chad and Jess along with their live crew saying things about him that were hurtful and personal. One such claim being that Darren would spend hours refreshing the World Under Blood MySpace page to inorganically boost their traction. Darren entered the tour bus, confronting the group, resulting in a one-sided brawl that left him no choice but to leave the tour. He stated that it was time for him to rest and work on his alcohol abuse. CKY and their new album were now on ice indefinitely. Darren and the rest of the band spent months holding dearly onto their grudges. Progress on the record was eventually made during this period, albeit slowly, with the band sharing files back and forth via email, though still not on speaking terms. At some point, Roadrunner began to threaten litigation. After all, you can't just sign a recording contract, spend a label's money, and expect not to deliver on the album you promised. Miller decided to again list Logan Mater, his go-to engineer for the World Under Blood sessions, to assist him in producing the rest of the album. Ginsberg learned this information through Roadrunner, and it would prove to be the bluff needed to get the band back together to finish the recording. This reunion was reported on in October 2008, a full year after the breakup. Luckily, the recording process was nearing completion by the time of the breakup, so only a few odds and ends needed attending to. Darren would later claim that the drums on the record were heavily edited because Jess was either absent for the recording or that he couldn't actually play the drum parts. But Jess went on to say that the drum sound was heavily edited by a drum replacement software known as Drumagog. Apparently, this was a specific request by the oddly stringent Roadrunner. I, for one, would love to know why Roadrunner would demand the drums be replaced with samples. Finally, the artwork for this new outing titled Carver City featured some much-needed polish in comparison to previous releases. The artwork for Volume 1, IDR, and Answer were designed with a minimalist approach. This was mostly due to the fact that the band would put the visual direction on the back burner until the last second. This time, Careful consideration was taken, and Travis Smith was hired to design the album's artwork. Even if this is the first time you're hearing his name, you may have seen Travis Smith's art at some point, especially if you're a fan of metal music. He has done artworks for the likes of Death, Suffocation, Opeth, Amorphous, Devin Townsend, and many more. Smith proved to be a perfect choice, as for once CKY had a proper visual direction to coincide with their unique take on rock and metal. Yeah. <laughs> 
Carver City would release with little promotion and thusly little fanfare on May 19th, 2009, with a disappointing and ultra low budget video for single A Number One Roller Rager released shortly thereafter. Many appreciated the return to the use of the Moog synthesizer, but the album felt so ridiculously dense that the production work of Ginsburg proved confusing at best. To this day, Carver City has sold north of 40,000 copies, hardly comparable to their previous sales numbers. In an uncommon move for the time, Roadrunner released the album on vinyl, though they handled it sloppily. As the track list was misprinted and it was a gamble whether or not the vinyl would come with liner notes at all. Clearly, Roadrunner wanted little to do with a band so unstable. As much as it was a positive to have Monty Connor working with them, it seemed as if he was the only one at the label who cared. Any goodwill CKY had accumulated upon their signing had been washed away in 2007. It appeared that the higher ups at Roadrunner were only keen to just release the record fulfill contract obligations, and drop the band as soon as possible. It must also be noted that in January of 07, Warner Music Group had acquired a majority stake in Roadrunner. This was a bad sign for CKY, as even the slightest change in a record label's management can make or break the signed artists. In Roadrunner's case, this was an even worse sign, as Warner has had a history of buying up smaller labels, running them into the ground, and then killing them off entirely. Plus, the music industry had been suffering in general around this time. The shockwaves created by Napster a decade earlier had finally hit their peak. It was getting excruciatingly difficult to sell records in a market where no one was buying them. Ponder for a moment on some of the bands that had major hits at the time of CKY's peak in 2002. Most of those bands, with the exception of your System of a Downs, your Slipknots, your Linkin Parks, most of those bands were gone, done, dropped from the label, dead. Jess's brother, Bam Margera, mega celebrity and CKY's biggest promoter, had now spent two years without a TV show, spending more of his time drinking and drugging than anything else. He was becoming irrelevant. It also didn't do any favors that the skate craze of the early 2000s was now over, something that helped CKY gain and sustain traction in their early days. It was by this time that the quartet had begun to find themselves in the twilight of their careers. The live crowds got smaller and smaller, and the tensions within the band grew higher and higher. So, unsurprisingly, this is where things begin to spiral. On the Carver City Tour, CKY gained in numbers with the addition of Matthew Genitus, or as he's so lovingly called, Matty J. Matty J would play live keyboards and provide backup vocals. That is, until 2010, when Matt Dice would exit the band, citing poor health, back issues, and a need to commit to family. The problem being, his departure was so close to a nearing European tour. Now this would not be the first time Dice left a band just before a tour, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. And really quickly, I do want to cap off that statement in defense of Dice. I don't think that there's anything wrong with leaving a band that's failing, that's detrimental to your health, or if there are more pressing and urgent matters and responsibilities in your personal life that mean more to you than just being in a band, playing lots of shows, making lots of money, and partying. Matty J would replace Matt Dice for live bass duties, and Murray would fill the position of live keyboard player. CKY were now making the rounds in Europe playing Sonosphere Festival, and even their first show in Japan in support of Carver City. And while it may seem from their touring schedule that the band was still growing, the well had truly started to dry up for CKY, and its members were becoming increasingly aware of it. Live set lists had dwindled down to almost exclusively songs from their first two albums. Darren would state initially that this was a result of fans not knowing their discography post-2002 but went on to later state that it also had to do with two members of the band becoming increasingly lazy. The attendance for CKY shows had shrunken significantly to the extent in which the band had begun to either barely break even or end up in the red after their tours. Or so says Darren. On September 30th, 2010, CKY released the single Afterworld, which was on the Jackass 3D soundtrack. This was the first track since Volume 2 that would feature Chad on lead vocals. Chad actually recorded the vocals for the track while Darren was out getting food for the band. Sounds a little odd, no? 
The band enjoyed the song, though, and when Bam offered to direct the video, the rest of the band declined, except for Chad, who really put his heart into seeming like a legit badass rock star who scores loads of hot chicks and drinks straight bourbon. You know, because that's what real badass front men like Chad do. This video is terribly embarrassing to watch, even just as a fan. But I don't know if I could completely condemn Chad's participation. I know it sounded harsh and all, and the video sucks, I stand by that. But can you really hate a guy for taking advantage of an opportunity to be the lead singer in a music video? I mean, it was in the end Bam's direction, it was his treatment, it was his idea, and Chad went with it. My real problem with the music video is not who's in it, but the fact that it's antithetical to everything that CKY stood for for the first 11 years of their career. It was in July that the Phil Bowman directed and produced CKY What Next video would be released onto YouTube. In this video, the band opens up about their possible plans for releasing music in the future. All four guys just seem burnt out, like unmotivated, in complete disagreement with one another about the future of the band. Darren seems unwilling to write another standard CKY record. Despite this, Darren expresses his willingness to try a KISS-like collection of four solo albums, one for each member of the band. Let's put that into perspective, cause what? Darren doesn't want to write another 10 songs unless the other guys write 10 songs too? Jess seems interested in the idea, but he isn't sure what he'll write, considering he doesn't sing or play stringed instruments. It seems more to me that Darren was trying to prove something with this idea. Now to this proposition, Chad stands firmly opposed, which is understandable when you consider that Chad's workload would quadruple with the engineering and producing of four new albums worth of material, let alone the fact that he also had to write one of those albums completely on his own. Ginsburg also expresses his desire to get in a room together and actually write songs together, in contrast to the method on their last three albums in which Darren would have collections of riffs that he'd fit together like a puzzle. And with Carver City and An Answer Can Be Found, this Frankensteining of riffs and song parts was mostly done in Pro Tools. So not the most organic form of songwriting, that's for sure. Miller entirely opposes the idea of organically writing songs as a unit, feeling as if they wouldn't write good songs if they just jammed together. Maddie J is somewhere in the middle here, willing to let the guys take the band in whichever way they see fit but feels hopeful that if they go through with this four album package idea, it can bring the band closer to actually getting together and writing a record in a more collaborative manner. Chad expresses his feelings about wanting to condense the overproduced nature of their work and cut back on some of the clutter. Darren and Jess are particularly disappointed in the performance of Carver City, with Jess positing the notion that all their hard work was for nothing when most people can easily torrent their music. I very much recommend you check out this video because my words will not adequately describe the feeling one will get from just watching it. It's kind of shocking to hear musicians who were once hungry and motivated become dejected and pessimistic about their own career path. It was also in July 2011 that Darren's melodic death metal side project World Under Blood dropped their debut LP, Tactical, an album nearly six years in the making. Unfortunately, like with Carver City, Tactical and World Under Blood as a whole were snake-bitten from the very beginning. Firstly, I challenge you to think of any supergroup bands you may know of. Typically, these types of bands are comprised of high-level rock musicians who have made enough money to put aside their primary source of income to take a risk, follow their creative instincts, try something new, you know? In death metal, this kind of financial security and ability to try new things is really hard to come by. With the exception of Darren, could the rest of World Under Blood withstand the financial risk of touring in a new and unproven band? I can't say for certain, but I definitely have doubts. Secondly, the Tactical album was released at an awful time. Death Metal hadn't really been in a good place since the mid-90s from a commercial standpoint. What was, two decades earlier, a growing underground movement that was beginning to move units, quickly stagnated and was overtaken in the eyes of metal labels by new metal acts in the mid to late 90s and never really bounced back from it. And after new metal died out, it was just time for metalcore to take the stage. That being said, it was possible that World Under Blood's saving grace in regards to marketing was its connection to Darren and CKY. When the album was first announced in 06, CKY had already peaked. 
but it's highly likely that the popularity and fan base was still strong enough and willing to support side projects from the main members. Sadly, the James Murphy produced Tactical wasn't completed until 2010, a full two years after Darren inked the deal with Nuclear Blast. Now by this point, the entire band was self-medicating, some heavier than others. Chad was drinking his Jack Daniels and smoking his weed, and though he chilled out significantly since the earlier days, he still had his moments. Jess still loved his yinglings, but Darren, by many accounts, was hitting the hard liquor and mixing it with prescription antidepressants and painkillers, and you don't need to be a doctor to know that this is an extremely dangerous concoction. In August 2011, Darren regretfully announced the departure of Chad, one that was allegedly unbeknownst to all but Miller until they performed as a three-piece at the gathering of the Juggalos. Miller also announced his own departure after the planned dates, but would later state that this was because he refused to play Australia's Soundwave Festival in 2012 as a three-piece. None of this came to pass, however, and Ginsberg would state that he never left the band. Keep note that there are multiple testimonies regarding this period, and it's still quite unknown the true nature of the situation. If you expect me to try to turn this into a hit piece on anyone in the band, I'm really trying to be as impartial as I can and give as much as the story as I have heard, have read, have seen. And sure, I've already hit you with little blurbs of my opinion here and there. However it worked out, Darren alleges that he wasn't kept in the know, thus adding to his already tiresome attitude regarding the band. Before announcing what would be the end of CKY as we knew it and their final show together, Ginsburg would tweet, Everyone keeps asking. Fact is, I personally really wish CKY could continue making albums and touring. Darren does not want to continue with CKY. CKY would play their final show with their original three members, A Sort of Homecoming, in Reading, PA, on December 18th, 2011. The show was titled Christmas with CKY, and while it seemed alright at first, it eventually became a disaster, the likes of which fans still murmur of today. Darren, being allegedly high off prescription medication and drunk off liquor, began to complain his guitar rig was malfunctioning. Some have alleged that Darren was intentionally sabotaging his rig, but no one really knows but the band. In between songs, Darren handed off his guitar to be attended to, and when he got it back, he annoyingly scraped and scratched at the strings for what felt like a lifetime. In any case, when it rains, it pours. Darren gave up his guitar duties for their go-home song, Close Yet Far. Um, well, by smashing his Jackson on Jess's cymbals. And then, chucking it inches away from his head. As if things weren't any worse, when they finally started playing Close Yet Far, the loss of Darren on rhythm guitar hollowed out the sound, since Chad only played synth leads on the guitar for this song. Darren's vocals here were undeniably awful, and it's terrible to see someone self-destruct on stage like this. We all hate to be reminded of our most embarrassing moments of intoxication, but imagine that the perception created by those embarrassing moments were impossible to shake for a lot of people. The band finished on the lowest note that they possibly could have, and the era of CKY had officially folded in on itself. The band would replace Miller with the son of Kink's guitarist and close friend of Jess, Daniel Davies, for their spot on 2012's Soundwave in Australia. Chad, Jess, and Maddie also revealed that they were working on a new CKY album with Davies. Well, it's, not, it's not really a cut and paste type of method we're doing. Yeah. We're writing songs together. Like right. a real band would write a song. Like, if we wanted to, we could probably, like, we hope to be able to just play it live in the studio if we wanted, you know? Darren attempted to pursue World Under Blood with Tim Young, Luke Yeager, and now Kyle Conkiel. Tim Young dropped out pretty quickly, though, due to touring commitments with Morbid Angel. Darren would recruit Mike Heller for drumming duties, but a World Under Blood show would sadly never come to fruition. According to Miller, the band would be offered a spot opening for tech death legends Cynic, but were only offered 800 per show. 
Thusly, World Under Blood was unofficially put on hold, and Darren would explore acting throughout the 2010s, appearing in indie B-horror films like Deadly Christmas, No Solicitors, and Dahmer vs. Gacy. Life after quitting your main profession can be rough from a financial standpoint. Miller began to sell off tons of rare CKY merch and make brand new handmade reprints of rare CKY albums. For the collectors, all of these reprints were assigned and labeled by number and thus can easily be recognized from their original pressings. His eBay store wouldn't last long after this though, as some claims from KISS collectors came out, alleging that Darren was buying used KISS albums, resealing them, and then selling them as new. In fall of 2012, Darren would launch a Kickstarter campaign for a solo album. Sadly, it was doomed to fail, due to the heaps of negative sentiment swirling about his often cynical and biting comments on Facebook concerning his former bandmates and even fans, as well as the hopes of remaining fans that Darren could reunite with the band once more on good terms. Despite some really cool campaign perks like a documentary, a bonus album, and more, it only got 92 backers and reached $8,477 out of the massive $35,000 goal. Darren reacted with intense vitriol, posting a photo of a copy of the CKY B-Sides and Rarities vinyl set ablaze. What I think Darren failed to realize here was that he and his band had fostered a young fan base that, while loyal, was also fiercely dogmatic. The CKY Alliance had proven time and time again in the past that they would do anything for their heroes. Case in point, when Darren had targeted the harassment of Rolling Stone writer Jenny Ellescu. Ellescu and Rolling Stone were seen by the fan base as an enemy to point a finger at for all of the career hiccups of CKY in 2005. So when the band finally ended, who did you think they were going to point the finger at? In their heyday, Darren, Chad, and Jess were unbelievably critical of just about every single band that existed as peers. This too created an insanely high standard amongst the fans, one of which the band themselves could rarely meet. With Darren's frequent online outbursts against fans, his behavior at the Christmas show, and his burning of the CKY vinyl, he became the number one target of his especially ravenous fan base. And to this day, there are people that will go to his shows 10 plus years after his departure from CKY just to cross their arms and thumb their nose or heckle. There is a massive subgroup of the fan base that exists to trash any move the guy makes just for the sick pleasure of it all. That being said, he should not be exempt from criticism. His actions here officially divided the fans into two camps. And while I don't have the time to divulge every single bad or good thing each of these guys have said or done, Darren was far more active in expressing his anger on Facebook, and the rest of CKY kept things low-key. Despite Miller's situation, things weren't all rainbows for the rest of CKY. Chad, Jess, and Maddie went on to tour with Bam Margera's new shit rock band, Fuckface Unstoppable, as they casually sipped beers and toked joints while watching a friend and family member pill and booze themselves half to death for the fun of it. Ginsburg would eventually leave Fuckface Unstoppable, obviously strained by the non-stop drinking and drugging, but his reasoning was never fully expounded upon. He instead offered a blog link from their tour manager in Australia that detailed some of the insanity. Darren, Chad, and Matty J had all pulled out from answering Ask CKY questions on the CKY Alliance website for a few years at this point but Jess kept it going by continuously answering inane questions about the music industry, CKY songs, and politics. Jess finally pulled out of Ask CKY in October that year. In April of 2013, Darren decided to give music another go, this time launching an Indiegogo campaign for a solo acoustic album, covering all the CKY classics plus some covers. It was a great success this time around. With 303 backers and $12,497 raised on an $8,000 goal. It was released in December 2013 under the title Acoustified, which was recorded, produced, mixed, and mastered by Stephen Petrie. It was eventually re-released on Megaforce Records in 2014 with extra tracks. In January 2014, Darren would drop a bombshell on fans. He posted several pictures on his Facebook of him jamming with Chad 
ultimately announcing a CKY reunion was imminent. Darren had posted that he was excited to see who was willing to come back and that he'd put out feelers to several ex-members. Darren also returned to ask CKY to answer a few fan remarks. As exciting as this was, Miller went quiet shortly thereafter, only to tell the fans that this reunion was DOA. He later levied claims that during their jams, Chad's behavior had gotten increasingly strange as the days went on, to the point in which Chad was almost interrogating Darren about his Facebook posts and the Acoustified album. So the reunion was now dead, and Darren took it upon himself to revive his former technical death metal project, Foreign Objects. According to Darren, he reached out to Jess to rejoin, but Jess was less than receptive. This put Darren in a predicament in which he had no choice but to search out new blood for the Foreign Objects revival. He recruited Tim Luera on drums, Sean Luera on bass, and Dave Sudok on guitar. Sudok left the band to join Trapped. Luckily, Sudok left Trapped before it became the total and utter PR catastrophe that it is now. Kenneth Hunter took his place and doubled as the band's in-house producer. After successfully launching an Indiegogo project and revealing a brand new lineup for Foreign Objects, it would be nearly a full year before their album, Galactic Prey, was released. This period was marred by controversy as Darren had gone all out and taken to Facebook to air his grievances with his former bandmates and also finding himself in a dispute with then-collaborator John Massey. Massey had in part inspired the new album, writing the music to Galactic Prey's title track. Massey claimed that Darren was entirely energized by his writing and was the catalyst to the revival of Foreign Objects. But soon after the Indiegogo campaign was funded, Miller went ghost mode on John. After months of no contact, no funding, and feeling ripped off, Massey went on to launch his own Indiegogo campaign for all of the original music he'd initially intended to be part of the new Foreign Objects album. Darren attacked John online, calling him starstruck, telling fans that John's Indiegogo campaign was a scam and resorted to leaking at least one of the tracks that he deemed unworthy of release. John Massey released his album, titled Revolutional, in November. It was in summer 2015 that Chad would soon reappear with a teaser video for his own solo album, Rock and Roll Alibis. Shortly after, CKY announced that they were playing Amnesia Rock Fest, featuring Matt Dice back on bass and Daniel Davies taking frontman duties once more. Around this time, Darren took to Facebook and claimed that CKY would return again under his control, and despite being aware that Bam Margera had ownership of the CKY name, he believed that there would be a legal way around it. Chad Ginsburg's solo record, Rock and Roll Alibi, is released in July of 2015. Darren once again found himself embroiled in controversy, as his new band was booked to play an August 25th show at the Viper Room under the name Darren Miller's CKY Plus Foreign Objects. Miller vented to the now defunct Sinner's Ball radio show host, Mr. Sinister, that Jess and Chad had tattled to Bam, who in turn sicked a lawyer to try to get the show pulled. Why? Well, to put it succinctly, Bam does own the name CKY. Why would he own the name? Well, aside from the fact that he did make the CKY videos, why else do you think? Consider in addition that Bam also co-owns the iconic Hardogram logo with Finnish goth rockers Him, a logo he didn't create. I'll allow you to postulate your own theories. I earn my fucking money. Are you talking about fuck you money? Like and I could buy your whole fucking band. Yeah, you could. Consider yet another digression, actually. Darren alleges that he never officially signed any documentation confirming his departure from CKY and that he is still considered a part owner of the organization. This claim has never been disputed to my knowledge. It has also been unanimously confirmed in interviews for years now that Darren himself created the name Camp Kill Yourself. Now sure, Bam Margera's first videotape was named CKY after Tom Yetto forced him to rename it. But obviously, Miller was the brain behind the creation of the brand. On every single pressing of Volume 1 prior to the band signing with Island Records, Darren is credited as the sole writer. 
After Island pressed up their edition of Volume 1, the record was revised to state, written by Darren Miller with Chad Ginsberg and Jess Margera. This would be seen again on IDR. An answer can be found in Carver City would credit Darren Miller with Chad Ginsberg. All I can really say is that it seems a little suspect, and as much as Darren has been thought to bend the truth, he has claimed that he was pressured to credit the rest of the band by the record label and the management, and I don't think he's lying. Even Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins has experienced something similar. They said, uh, now who writes the songs? And I said, well, I do. And they said, well, that's going to be a problem. Songwriters and bands make a lot more money. So our suggestion is you should share your songs with your bandmates to keep sort of a kind of a democratic stasis. That's not to diminish the creative input that Ginsberg had, as the producer is the guiding hand that directs the execution of an album. But not even Ginsberg owns the rights to the name. Of all people, Jess Margera and Bam Margera Incorporated are the current owners of the trademark. They know who created the name, and they know who wrote a majority of the songs. Obviously, it was not Bam or Jess Margera. You've been doing just, quite a lot. It's like a one-off thing. Yeah, which you've been doing quite a lot. Sitting around doing fucking nothing, waiting for Darren to write songs. I think what I'm trying to get across here is that Darren probably assumed that by quitting, he would put the band on a permanent hiatus. That they would not be able to go on without him. But alas, this is not how trademark law works. And in essence, at least in the case of a recording artist, if you own the name, you basically own the band. If you're a musician in a band with big ambitions and you can't seem to get along with the people you work with, perhaps take this as a cautionary tale of sorts. Foreign Objects dropped Galactic Prey in October of 2015. Miller spent the last months of 2015 playing with Foreign Objects at various clubs in Southern California, still under the name Darren Miller's CKY and Foreign Objects. Ginsburg would also embark on a short tour in venues across the West Coast. Ringing in the new year, Jess clued in fans that the new CKY album would be recorded at the legendary Abbey Road Studios in London, England, and that Chad would take the mantle as lead vocalist. In February of 2016, Miller declared his return to rock music. Much to the ire and bewilderment of fans, it was not under the name CKY like he said it would, but Mecca CKY. Many fans derided the name for being too weird, too derivative. And when you read it plainly, it kind of comes out more like me chacky. Darren cited his love of the Godzilla movie series and took inspiration from the Mecha Godzilla character. In any case, Mecha CKY, retaining the members of Foreign Objects, would release a demo of Conditioned or Unconditional as a teaser to stir up the hype. Those with a keen ear may recognize this song as a reworked version of an unreleased four-track demo recorded during the pre-production phase of Carver City. In April, CKY was slotted for that summer's Random Hero Fest, a festival created by Bam Margera to honor the life of Ryan Dunn. Miller took this time to let fans know that he would not be playing and clarifying that he was in the midst of taking legal action against the band over the name. We would no longer hear about said legal action, but suffice to say there's only so much you can do in court to fight a guy who has unlimited resources. So, Chad... Jess and Dice played the show in June and were now free to begin the recording of CKY's fifth official release. No longer was the album to be recorded at Abbey Road, but at Rancho de la Luna in Joshua Tree, California. August brought a much needed rebrand of Mecha CKY, now known as 96 Bitter Beings. In addition, a new Indiegogo campaign was started to fund the writing and recording of not one, but two albums. Would fans get two albums? For $25, backers would receive a copy of the album Camp Pain on CD. Get it? However, the second album, titled Synergy Restored, would be shopped to record labels in the hopes that it would land them a deal. Now, to be fair, all of that was actually in the fine print on the Indiegogo funding campaign, so it's not really like this should have come as a shock to anybody. Initially, Camp Payne was promised to be exclusively for the fans that paid for it and would not be released to streaming services or digital retailers like iTunes or Spotify. And now, 
with their fates etched into the annals of time, the former frontman and the rest of CKY were thereby set on permanently diverging paths. Unlike the rest